Good morning. It's good to see you here at Midway today. That one's working really well. All right. Well, if you would stand with us, we're going to sing together this morning. It's just like his great love. How are you familiar with this song? Uh, it's just like his great love. All right. Two of you. This will be fun. All right. So we're going to try to sing loud and that'll help you learn it. And then just join in as you catch on to it. This is a great song. Uh, it gets us our, our, our blood pumping this morning on Sunday morning. song appropriate for this week uh, now that we're getting a little bit of sunshine back in our lives. Isn't that great? Looking forward to a little bit more of that uh, in the weeks ahead as we get into summer here. But uh, before we do anything else this morning, why don't we pray? We'll ask God's blessing um, as we get started here today. Brother Ian uh, Gilworth, would you please lead us in prayer, sir? Amen. Ephesians chapter 3 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. That's what we're here to do this morning, to bring glory to God, to lift the name of Jesus. And so sing along with us this morning as we sing about the unchanging Lord Jesus Christ. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. We're going to sing this, uh, start off with the chorus here. Glory to his name, glory to his name. Glory to his name. is the same. 
Jesus never glory to his name. thankful that uh, that there's one source of hope for the Christian life. There's not all these different rites and rituals we have to keep up with to be right with God, to have salvation, to have a hope of heaven. We don't have to go to this deity and this deity and this deity. It's in Christ alone that our hope is found. So simple, the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ, in Christ alone. In Christ alone. Is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man, can ever pluck me from his hand, till he returns, or calls me into the solid rock here. My hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ 
sing this morning. Please be seated there. And we trust that the Lord has been honored by his people uh, through the songs that we sang today. At this time, uh, we're going to get ready to dismiss our kids for Children's Church. If you guys, sixth grade and under, uh, would be dismissed there and head on upstairs to class. Uh, Miss Heather's going to take care of you guys uh, today and hope you guys have a good time up there. Uh, they're continuing on uh, through the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. So they're going to have a good time together this morning as they talk about Enoch. Enoch, we talked about him a few weeks ago, but uh, remember the first time you heard about Enoch in the Bible? That guy who was just transformed, just disappeared. And you remember thinking as a kid, boy, I'd like to see what that's like, you know? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? The, the, the wonder of a child uh, in their face. So I hope they're getting a lot out of it today. Um, but we're going to give our tithes and offerings this morning. We're going to uh, pause our hearts here before we get into the uh, ser- sermon time. And uh, give our tithes and offerings together here today. And uh, thank you for your faithfulness. And remember the first time you gave in an offering and the wonder that you felt. And you said, boy, I'd like to participate in that. Uh, what, that that's what we're going to do here this morning. We're going to give uh, to the Lord as he has prospered us. And uh, we thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. And uh, let's pray together and ask God to bless these funds. Brother said, would you lead us in prayer, sir? Amen. All right, John chapter 1 together this morning. John chapter 1, that's where we're going to turn uh, while the plate is passed there. John chapter 1, we're going to read this portion of Scripture together, and uh, then we're going to get into our uh, sermon time, our study, and I hope that it's a help to you. Uh, John chapter 1. A little bit of housekeeping here, guys. That's First John chapter 1. We need John chapter 1. I think that's a little higher up the chain there. All right. If you can find it, if not, that's okay. All right. There we go. John chapter 1, verse number 1. John chapter 1, verse number 1. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined, shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Let's pray together and we'll ask God to help us today. God, thank you so much for your people gathered together in your house today. From the youngest child in the nursery uh, to the most senior citizen sitting in a, in a uh, chair here in this room today. Lord, we thank you for each and every one of them. Lord, I pray that you'd bless those that are away from us today. Uh, Lord, we're getting into a busy time of year for folks. A lot of folks on the road, traveling, uh, driving, catching up with family members. We pray for safety upon each and every one. And we pray for your blessing while they're away. And Lord, we pray you'd bring them back to us safely. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, as we spend some time together this morning in your word, that God, you would arrest our attention. God, that you would focus our hearts on what we have set here in front of us in John chapter 1 so that we can apply it to our lives, Lord, so that we can uh, take this information and use it for transformation, that your Holy Spirit can transform us uh, into the image of Jesus Christ today. And, Lord, there, I'm sure there's some area in each and every one of our lives or many areas maybe that need to be touched, that need to be molded uh, to be more like Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, for the soul uh, that is nearest hell, for the soul that doesn't know Jesus Christ here today, I pray you'd speak to their heart 
and show them their need for Christ. May they trust him today. But Lord, for each and every person here today, I pray that the word of God would speak to us because it is alive, it is powerful, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. So Lord, we pray that you'd cut us where we need to be cut and bandage us where we need to be bandaged. But God, help us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Seems like a little bit of a departure, our scripture reading this morning, from where we've been uh, before in the book of Genesis. We've been working uh, through systematically chapter by chapter through the book of Genesis, Genesis 1 all the way through chapter 11, and we ended that study st- series of studies last week um, on the story of the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel. And so this week we're going to continue to study together um, this idea of in the beginning, But we're going to fast forward a little bit in our Bibles. But by fast forwarding in our Bibles, we're actually not going anywhere. We're actually staying right where we started, okay? Because what are the first three words of John chapter 1? In the beginning. In the beginning. And so John is actually tying the, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ back to the book of Genesis. He's tying it all the way back there and saying that there is a connection between the truth that we see in Genesis, uh, in the book of Genesis, and specifically those first four major events in Genesis, and he's connecting Jesus Christ to those stories. Well, well how is Jesus connected to those things? Well, it tells us in uh, verse number two, I'm sorry, verse number three, it says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So we see Jesus all the way back in the book of Genesis, and we read Genesis chapter 1, and the Bible says that God said, let there be light, and there was light. How did that light come into being? How did that light come into, into existence? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was God's agent, his, uh, his, his means of creating light in the person of the, the, the second person of the Trinity, who we call Jesus Christ. So we're going to work our way through the book of John now, chapter by chapter. We're going to look at a different story each week and work through the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Genesis gave us the four most important events in human history. Now we're going to look at the most important person in human history. All right, so here in John, uh, we, we need to just set a little bit of groundwork here, set a little foundation so we can understand, but we need to know that this is a gospel record. This is a gospel record, all right? Or some people call it a gospel for short. But the gospel records are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament. And each one of them is a testimony of the events of Jesus Christ's earthly life and ministry, uh, what Jesus did while he was here on this earth. So John is the fourth gospel record in your Bible, and it's also the latest gospel record that was written. It's the last one that was penned. The other three had already been in circulation. Everybody had access to those for the most part. And then John was moved by the Holy Spirit to write his gospel record. And why is that? Because each one of these gospel records serves a different purpose. Each one of them is, has been written for a different means. The book of Matthew tells us about the life of Jesus Christ from the angle uh, that he is to be the promised king of the Jews. All throughout the Old Testament, God promised that there would be a king who would sit on the throne of King David. He would continue the dynasty of King David and that forever he would occupy that throne. And Matthew is making the case that Jesus is that promised king of the Jews. Mark wrote his gospel record to tell us that Jesus is not just the king of the Jews, although he is that, but he's also a suffering servant. He didn't come to be served but he came to serve others and to give his life a ransom for many, the Bible says, that he came to suffer for all of mankind. That is the kind of king that he is. That's the kind of leader that he is. He leads by serving. And then Luke comes on the scene and tells us that Jesus is not just God and he's not just the the, the king of the Jews and he's not just the suffering servant, but he is humanity in all its perfection where Adam and Eve sinned and fell in the Garden of Eden and corrupted themselves and where we have sinned and we corrupt ourselves by our sins, Jesus is the perfect form of humanity. He got it right everywhere where we get it wrong. And so it's an example for us of how perfect humanity should look like. Well, what is John's purpose? Why did he come on the scene? You see, in each one of these gospel records, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
the case is made that Jesus is the Son of God. That's, you can find that in each and every one of the gospel records, that Jesus is the Son of God, God himself. When we say he's the Son of God, we're saying that he is God. He's not less than God. He is God by, by, by virtue of the fact that he is the Son of God. But God, in his infinite wisdom, said we need to get this marked down even firmer. Let's make an even stronger case that Jesus is the Son of God. And so that's what John did when he sat down and took up his pen or his quill uh, and wrote under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He wrote to help us understand that he is God. Jesus is the Son of God. And so I want you, as we move through this book, chapter by chapter, to look and see who Jesus is in that chapter. What God is saying about Jesus Christ in that chapter, in that story, what's the case that God is making? These aren't just historical events. God is trying to transform people's lives. God's trying to speak to your needs. He's trying to deal with who we are as people. And so as we move through this, I want you to ask yourself that question, who is Jesus? By the way, just a little bit of note for you here. The, have you ever noticed that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all three of those gospel records seem to share a lot of the same material. When you read Matthew, it's a lot like reading Luke. And when you read Luke, it's a lot like reading Mark. And uh, they're just from different viewpoints, different details, little insertions here and there to, to clarify the story from Matthew's angle or from Luke's angle. But, for instance, Mark has 661 verses in it. 606 of those verses share material with Matthew's gospel record. So it's almost like they're a, a copy of each other with minor details changed between them. Over half of Mark's verses are shared with Luke. But the Gospel of John is almost entirely different from the other three books. So you are looking at a completely unique perspective of the life of Jesus Christ from someone who was there, someone who was an eyewitness of Jesus' life. So you're getting uh, the, the news straight from the source. Straight from the, the, the horse's mouth, so to speak. You know, don't, I just, when, I, when I look at news today, I actually put something on my Facebook last night about the, the state of news in our country today, and I was talking about it with somebody here this morning, and so we all feel it, we all understand it. But don't you get tired of what's called news today? I mean, people will write entire news articles that are nothing but people's Twitter comments. What did so-and-so have to say about what so-and-so did? Well, I don't care what so-and-so said on Twitter. I don't know that person. They don't know me. That person has nothing to do with this situation whatsoever. Who gives a rip, right? That, but that's news today. Well, I like to get my news from the horse's mouth. I like to get news straight from the source. And that's what we're going to do as we move through the book of John. So we need to start here, obviously, in John chapter 1. But I want you to understand, John chapter 1 is like the foyer to the rest of the book, okay? When you came in the building this morning, you walked into, we don't have a very big one, but you might call it the foyer, the vestibule, the opening room, right? The coat room, right? You walk inside, and what is the, what's the point of the foyer? It leads to the rest of the building, right? You can get to the build, rest of the building from that one space, you could turn left and go to the coffee bar or my office. You can go straight down the hallway and get to the gym or upstairs or the nursery or the auditorium and all that. But you have to step into the foyer to get there, right? That's what John is like. It's the foyer to the rest of the book. He's going to tell us some things. He's going to point out some things for us and say, over there is the coffee bar. Over there is the gym. Over there is the auditorium. What he's going to do is, as we work through this, you're going to see, he's going to say, Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the life. He's the truth. He's the way. He is the light of men. And he's pointing all of these things out to us because he's going to talk about this later. He's going to take the story of Jesus Christ and show us that he is the word, he is the truth, he is the way, he is the life. He's all of those things that he's going to tell us about. All right? And this is so important to John. This is so uh, core or fundamental, foundational to his message. And I want to prove that to you this morning. Go over to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. What we're going to be looking at this morning is something that John and the Holy Spirit 
believed was absolutely transformational truth, if we will grasp hold of it, okay? Keep your finger in John chapter 1 and go over to 1 John chapter 1. Let's look at this together, okay? And I want you to kind of, as we're reading it here, think back to John chapter 1, all right? And see if there's some similarities that you notice as we read it, okay? First John chapter 1, it says, we'll just read the first five verses. That which was from the beginning, hmm, sounds familiar, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word, that sounds familiar, of life. Hmm. Or have I heard that before? For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, saw that back in verse number 2 of John chapter 1, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. In these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light. Hmm. John chapter 1 again. And in him is no darkness at all. Huh. So in 1 John chapter 1 and in John chapter 1, John is saying, and by the way, this is the same writer, it's the same John who's penning these two books of the Bible. And under inspiration of God, he's saying, you need to nail this down right now. Before I go any further, I'm going to tell you right out that Jesus is the Word, He's the light, and He's the life. Now, a lot of times, the way that in our thinking, the way that we want to convince somebody or get somebody, persuade somebody to come around to our way of thinking is, we make the case, right? We give all the evidence and all the details. It's sort of like a courtroom drama. You know, you, you get up and you say, all right, we've got exhibit A and exhibit B and exhibit C, and all of this proves that this happened. That's not what John does. John starts, he flips the horse and the cart, and he says, I'm just going to tell you right out exactly where we're going with this. All right, he says, I'm just going to lay it out. I think John might have had a little bit of Midwest in him, all right? Because that's the way Midwesterners like to think sometimes. It's just, I'm just going to tell you, and then we'll talk about it. But he just came right out and said, Jesus is the Word, He's the light, and He's the life. Now let me explain a little bit. Okay, so I want us to stop here before we dig any deeper into chapter 1. And this week, we're just kind of going to work through the prologue. And we're just going to look at the life of the greatest person in human history from those three angles. He is the Word. He is the light, and he is the life. Okay, so let's start with that first one there, the word. John chapter 1, you can go back there. John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Literally, he is God, completely God, fully God, totally God, truly God. Not a God, not a deity, not divine but he is god himself that's a pretty big statement isn't it this person called the word the word now as we go through the rest of the chapter we begin to understand who the word is okay it says here in verse number 12 let's start in verse uh, number 10 it says he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not he came unto his own and his own received him not But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word, there's that that title again, the word was made flesh. So he became a man, became a person, and dwelt among us. So he lived among mankind. And it says here that we beheld his Glory, meaning John said, I was an eyewitness of his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So who did John see in all of his glory? Well, we're going to skip ahead here just a little bit because we can do that because we have the uh, ability to do that with our Bible sitting in front of us. There's a story where Peter, James, and John went up a mountain with Jesus. 
Just the three of them and Jesus. And on that mountain, Jesus transformed himself. He took off. Uh, he, he took off the dampener that was hiding his glory. And he revealed his glory in his brilliance and his brightness. And the Bible says there that he shone. And literally he was shining as, as God. He, he, they could see the glory of God shining through him. So when John says here in John chapter 1, we beheld his glory. Well, who are we talking about? Who's the word? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, it's clear cut who he's talking about here. The word, but why call him the word? Why call him the word? What kind of title is that? What he's saying here is that Jesus is the truth. Jesus is truth. He's like a living Bible. Every commandment that God ever made in the Old Testament, Jesus has kept. And by the way, he's completely fulfilled it. He's filled it out to its fullness. He's done it better than anybody could ever do it. He's done it perfectly. He is the living, breathing, talking, walking word of God. You hold within your hands, if you're holding a Bible, uh, you're holding within your hands God's word. This is what God wanted to communicate to you. This is what God wants mankind to have as his record of talking to mankind and his revealing of himself but God took his word and he turned it into flesh and bone and that that person is Jesus Christ it's an incredible thought isn't it that Jesus is everything that God commanded he is everything not just that God commanded but he's everything that God promised he's everything that God promised the Bible says that in him all the promises of God are yes and amen. Yes and so be it. That's what amen means. That Jesus Christ is the key to the promises of God. You and I can't claim the promises of God without Jesus Christ. We have no right to claim a promise of God without Jesus. Now God is good and God is kind and he is gracious and sometimes he lets people into uh, some blessings, and he pours out blessings on people that don't deserve it. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. There's no doubt about it. We'd like it to stop falling a little bit. Kind of glad that it slowed up a little bit. But the, the, the truth is there, that God's blessing pours on everybody. But if you want to get a hold of God's promises, you can't get there yourself. Religion won't get you there. Being good won't get you there. Jesus and only Jesus is your hope. Because he is the word of God. Okay? So Luke's gospel record started us off with the birth of Jesus Christ, right? Mark's gospel record just jumped right into the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. Matthew's gospel record goes all the way back to Jesus' genealogy. It takes us back through Jesus' family line. It's like the Ancestry.com of Jesus Christ. Okay, 23 and me right there on on the pages of scripture. But where does John start? And he goes back further than anybody. He goes back to the beginning. And really what he's saying here is that it's before the beginning. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and he says that in the beginning when that happened, Jesus was there. Jesus was there. So what is he saying about Jesus then if Jesus was there before anything else was? He is God because he's eternal. He's the creator. He's everything that Genesis 1 said about God. Jesus is. So Jesus must be God. It takes us back to the beginning and earlier. He was never born. Jesus was never born. And the good news is he's never going to expire. He's never going to expire. I did something this weekend that I've never done before. I made my own homemade sausage. Man, it felt, felt manly. It took some old deer. What, what does that look? You guys look at me like I'm strange. You guys don't eat sausage? I mean, come on. This is, this is northeast Missouri. Sure you do. But I made some sausage. Now, I know it's a strange story, but hang on, all right? So I had some old deer I needed to process, needed to get taken care of. It wasn't fit for grilling anymore, so I needed to do something with it. So I bought a meat grinder. And I bought some fat back from Hy-Vee. And I bought a little bit of pork sausage. And I put it all in there and ground it all up, and I cooked some up last night, and it was spot on, perfect, tasted great. All right, for the first time out, I thought it was pretty good. But I noticed something. The fat back was good, the uh, deer meat was good, but the, uh, 
the pork sausage that I put in there to add a little extra flavor to it, it expires on June the 1st. Well, what's today's date? June the 2nd, right? So we had to eat that stuff in a hurry because it expired, right? We had to get it down because my mom raised me. You got to be careful of two things or three things, chicken, fish, and pork, right? Those things will make you sick if you don't, if you don't take care of them right. So um, we ate it up. It's gone now, and the rest of it's in the freezer. But what's the point? You have to access the fun. You have to access the benefit of that quickly because it expires, right? Don't you hate it when you go into the fridge and you get the milk out and it's three-quarters of the way full and it expires tomorrow? I mean, all of a sudden, everybody's drinking milk. You know, you're inviting cats into the house to come drink up the milk because, you know, I don't know what it is. That, that, that $2.50 or $3 jug of milk is, just becomes priceless and precious to us at that time. We don't want to let that expire. And by the way, you know as well as I do that we let it go past a little time, a little bit, right? You just, you do the sniff test, right? How's it smell? I don't know. How's it smell to you? I mean, it smells like milk, I guess. I don't know. Well, it must be, okay. All right. So anyways, um, the point is this. The benefits that Jesus Christ brings to humanity, brings to our lives, has never expired. And it never will. Because he is the eternal word of God. In him, all the promises of God are yes and amen, and they always will be. There'll never be a time when Jesus fails. He predates Bethlehem. Jesus began a whole lot longer. uh, Actually, I said that wrong. He's been around since a whole lot longer than Bethlehem. Back in uh, back in the story in Luke chapter 2, he was around at the beginning. He was around before that, and he never, there's never been a time when he hasn't been around. All right, the word here that John uses with, when he says the word, that word there in the Greek is logos. Logos, that's why you see it all over the place. People use that word all the time. Logos, all right? There are three different words for word in Greek that you can use. The one that's used here, logos, is talking about a thought that is being expressed. How do you express your thoughts? You speak them, you write them, you draw them. You, there's all kinds of different ways to do that, but the thought is expressed. It's in your head, and now it has been completely and totally expressed. Okay, So if I were to come to you and just say, wept, that's not a, word, that's not a, a thought, that's a word, right? Jesus wept now i have expressed a complete thought correct wept is just a word jesus wept is a complete thought that's logos okay so what he's saying here is that jesus isn't just a word he's the word he's god's final and full and complete statement everything that you want to know about god you find in jesus christ everything that mankind needs to understand about salvation and redemption and forgiveness you find in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the main way that God has chosen to interact with us. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says that in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. God has spoken to mankind through Jesus Christ. What do you need for your life today? What do I need for my life today? Look to Jesus. What is the mountain that you're facing? What is the wall that needs climbing? What is the brick wall that needs knocking down in your life jesus is the answer look to jesus he has the help that you need because he is god's final word he is god's say so on the subject so it's not just a thought expressed but it's a complete thought it's a complete thought so why then as christians do we run to every other thing in the world that we can try to look for help Try to look for wisdom. Try to look for help from man and help from uh, worldly wisdom and worldly ways of thinking. Why do we think we're going to find any benefit in something that contradicts God's word, that goes against Jesus Christ? He is God's complete say-so on the subject. Everything that you need to know, God tells us in the word that is Jesus He's the word, he's, but he's the light. He's the light. Let's hurry on here and look at this for just a minute. It says here 
in verse number four, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus is the light. He has given us new perspective. Where there was darkness in our lives, where there's darkness in people's pathway, Jesus Christ is the light. So think of it this way. What he's saying is that we're living in a world full of darkness. We're living in a world full of confusion. We're living in a world full of evil. But Jesus is the opposite of all of that. Jesus is the key to answering all of those problems. He's the key to dealing with all of those issues. Now look, I know that preaching the gospel isn't going to solve every problem that the world has We still have to ask questions about what are we going to do about the economy? What are we going to do about business? What are we going to do about all of these things, pollution, whatever the case might be? But that's a really good place to start is with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, unlocks our minds. It enlightens our eyes and shows us that I I don't have all the answers right now, but I know the direction to go. I know where to find them. I know the worldview. I know the way of thinking that leads me to the answer. Jesus is the light. Anyone who has new life in Jesus Christ can also enjoy the light that he brings. The darkness has never understood the light, and it never will. Our world today looks at Christians and Christianity, and it has a few different reactions, but none of them are positive. Laughter mockery, a little bit of lip service of, oh, that's nice, or downright persecution. Because the darkness doesn't understand the light, and it never will. It never will. You can't bring understanding in that situation. You can't bring full understanding is what I mean by that. But you can bring enlightenment. The best thing to do is not to convince people The best thing to do is to convert people. People need the truth. People need Christ. And when they get Christ, they get the truth. When they get the Lord, they get the answers. Because now their eyes are enlightened. He is the light, but he's also the life. He's the life. By the way, when you step out of this building or this room today, on the back wall back there, we just changed out our our missionary display. I want you to go back there. It's touch screen. You can touch it and pull up missionary prayer letters, pull up the pictures of the families and their birthdays, email address, things like that, so you can communicate with them. And we need to stay on top of those people. We need to be there for those people. You know why? Because they're taking the light to a dark world. They're trying to bring light and love to a world that desperately needs it. But Jesus is the life. Let's look at this here for just a second. It says here in verse number 4, In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Jesus doesn't just bring new life. He is the life. He says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Why does that matter? Well, think about this for a second. Jesus, when a person trusts him, when a person accepts Christ, they are accessing Jesus is eternal life. You are enjoying the eternality of Jesus, okay? The fact that Jesus is eternal, when you trust Christ, now you get eternal life. And as long as Jesus is alive, your spirit will continue to live. As long as Jesus is doing well, as long as Jesus is alive and well, your soul will be alive and well when you trust him when you accept him, when you accept that free gift of salvation. So why then, Christian, do we try to find joy in life, in happiness, in peace, in so many things that go against him, that contradict him, that run counter to his way of thinking, that run counter to the life that he has brought to us. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Well, how do you get the abundant life? You live like Jesus lived. I would say that Jesus lived a pretty abundant life. I'd say that Jesus lived a life that made a difference, made an impact 
He changed the world. So why in the world do you and I try to find purpose and meaning and pleasure in all kinds of things that Jesus has absolutely nothing for, that Jesus wants nothing to do with? There's no joy to be found there. There's no purpose to be found there. There's no lasting peace to be found there. If you want the joy that Jesus had, and by the way, Jesus said, I am come that they might have my joy and that their joy might be full. Jesus wants us to have joy. But if you want that joy, like Jesus had that joy, you've got to live like Jesus lived. If you want to experience what Jesus experienced, if you want to do what Jesus did, you've got to live like Jesus lived. I remember when I was uh, in uh, college getting ready to get married, I was talking with my dad about how hard it is nowadays to make a go of, uh, uh, of life. You know, how hard it is to have a, you know, single parent home, or I'm sorry, a, uh, a single working parent home, one parent at home, one parent out in the job site. You know, the, back in the 50s that worked, but you know, that just doesn't work anymore. My dad said something that I thought was pretty enlightening. I don't know if it's 100% true, but I think there's maybe some wisdom in it. He said, Brian, he said, I know that's the way that they did things back in the 50s. By the way, he was around back in the 50s, so he would know. And he said, but if you want to live like they lived in the 50s, you have to live like they lived back in the 50s. You can't have four cell phones. You can't have cable. You can't have high-speed internet. You can't have four cars. You can't have jet skis. You can't have all that stuff. Now, if you want that stuff, there's a price to be paid to have it. But if that's the way you want it, then that's the way you've got to have it. And I thought, wow, there's some wisdom there. And by the way, I'm not, saying, I'm not down in anybody who doesn't live that way. I'm just making a point, okay? I'm just saying that if you want it that way, there's a price to be paid to have it that way. And that's what we see from the life of Jesus. Do you want a life that has meaning? Sure you do. Do you want to have a life that has a purpose to it? Of course you do. Do you want to live a life that makes a difference? When you leave this world, do you want people to walk by your casket and say, man, Praise the Lord for the difference that they made. Man, they were an awesome neighbor. They were an awesome friend. Boy, I just, uh, I don't know what we would have done without that person. Or do you want them to walk by and say, that guy still owes me 50 bucks. Boy, he's the biggest cheat in town. Well, he'd lie to you as soon as look at you. He'd do anything for a buck. You know, do you want to be that person? Or do you want to make a difference? Do you want to influence? If you want to make a difference like Jesus made a difference, you've got to live the life like Jesus lived it. He is the word. He is the light. He is the life. And so I ask you this morning, have you accepted and taken that life for yourself? Have you accepted Jesus Christ? Because in him, morality is explained, our doubts disappear, our superstitions are dispelled, and truth becomes more obvious. Romans chapter 8 and verse 2 says, For the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Did you catch that? The law of life has made me free from the law of death. What we have in Jesus Christ is new life. So if you don't have that eternal life in Jesus Christ, it's time to put that old, death, old life to death. It's time to put an end to that and live in the new life that Jesus has for you, once and forever. And if you have eternal life in Jesus Christ, if you know Christ as your Savior, what are we doing with it? Don't waste it. Don't throw it away. Don't misuse and abuse the opportunities that God has given to you. God wants your life to be an abundant life, not because there's lots of money and lots of stuff and lots of things. I think you got that point but because there's lots of God in it. There's lots of his presence in it. There's lots of his power in it. You're there for the people that need you to be there. You're making a difference where you are. And by the way, sometimes you don't even know you're making a difference. It's amazing to me. I was talking with somebody here recently about funerals. And they're sad occasions. They're somber occasions. But a lot of times we talk about people and we say things, I thought, somebody told me this, I thought this was pretty, pretty smart, pretty enlightened. They say a lot of times we say things about people at funerals 
that are so wonderful and they're so sweet and kind. And that person probably would have liked to hear that, right? That person probably would have enjoyed knowing that you felt that way about them. So probably a good idea to go ahead and say it now while they're still here so they can enjoy it and benefit from it. But when, you're, when your life is over, people are going to say things and think things about you that they never would have said to your face. Hopefully good things. Hopefully not bad things. But how are you living this life? How are you leading it? Are you accomplishing something with the life that God has given to you in Jesus Christ? Can we pray together? Let's bow our heads and our hearts here this morning and ask God to help us in this truth that we've looked at today. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the people that are gathered together, their attentiveness to your word. God, I pray that you have been glorified. I pray that Jesus has been exalted because, God, he is so amazing. These three thoughts, the word, the light, and the life that Jesus is, God, it expresses so much of who he is, but yet there's so much we still don't understand. There's still so much that we can't get to the bottom of because he is like an unending bottomless treasure chest we continue to dig we continue to dig we continue to dig and we never hit bottom lord thank you for the gold mine that we have in our relationship with jesus christ not because we get so much but because he has been so good to us because he is so trustworthy he is so unfailing so that when times get rough when it's hard to get the bills paid when the kids are acting up, when business is not as good as it should be, when we're looking at a layoff, Lord, we can still rest on the fact that Jesus is the Word of God. He's the light of the world, and He is our eternal life. He is our eternal and undying hope. Lord, help us to live in that truth this week. Help us to live like people that know Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed here this morning, if you say, Pastor Brian, I know that I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. And I can tell you why from the Bible. If that's you this morning, would you just slip your hand up there as a testimony to God? Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can put your hands down there. If you were unable to raise your hand, I want you to know that God wants to show you today. He wants you to know how to have your sins forgiven, and how to have a home in heaven. And we can help you with that today. Would you just come forward during the, our song time and our prayer time and just get my attention and let me help you with that. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Brian, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven, but God's dealing with my heart today. Maybe it's something we talked about today. Maybe God applied something to your heart. Or maybe it's something completely different. But you say, Pastor Brian, pray for me. God's working on my heart today. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up there? I just want to pray for you. Anybody like that? Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Brother Marty is going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation, hymn 474, Constantly Abiding. And if God's speaking to your heart, I'd invite you to come. I'll be down front if you need somebody to speak with or pray with. Maybe you need to deal with your, where, whether or not heaven's your home. Maybe we need to take care of that today. Why don't you come forward and let me help you with that. Maybe you're uh, needing to get baptized. Maybe you've never been baptized after your salvation. Let's, let's talk about that. Let's work on that. Or maybe you say, I want to put my life here. I want to put my influence here. I want to be a part of what God's doing here at Midway Baptist Church. Why don't you just come forward and, and get a hold of me and let's work on that. Or maybe you just need to find a quiet place to pray and spend some time alone with God this morning. Whatever the need of your heart is, as Brother Marty leads us in this hymn of invitation, would you stand with us and let's sing along here. Hymn 474, there's a peace in my heart.
you for who you are. We thank you that we have a God in heaven that is not blind or deaf, but God, you see what's going on in our lives. You see the struggles that we face. And God, you have the answer to them. Because God, you're not new to the situation. You always have been and always will be there. And so Lord, you've seen people with our struggles. You've seen people with our sin burdens. You've seen people uh, go through the things that uh, we all face. And Lord Jesus, you even lived on this earth and you walked in our steps. You trod the very ground. You got the very uh, soles of your feet dirty walking this earth. You know what it's like. And so, Lord, we come to you today with needs and cares and burdens, and we hand them over to you. We ask you to help us. We ask you to give us strength. Lord, uh, we, we know better than to ask for answers to all of our questions. But, Lord, we lean on the one who knows the answers to all the questions. And, Lord, as long as we have Jesus, as long as we have you, we don't really need all the answers to the questions. We just need more of you. Lord, help us to rest in you today. Help us to find strength in you and to find our wholeness and our peace in Jesus because he is the word, he is the light, he is the life. Lord, thank you again for blessing us. Uh, be with the souls and that are carrying burdens today. Give them much strength, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated there for just a moment. Let me share with you a couple of announcements of some things coming up. Remember, uh, first of all, that the uh, WA baby shower uh, is coming up. Uh, that is next Sunday, and I want you to uh, be here and be a part of that. And uh, let's shower them with some love and some gifts. They're registered at Target and Amazon. And so if you can participate in that, please be here next Sunday. If not, just go ahead and uh, bring your gifts uh, sometime, and we'll get those put out for them. Uh, but love to see some folks out for that. And uh, then June 20th, Pensacola Christian College is going to be here uh, for a teen activity. Um, they're going to be here from 3 to 6 p.m. That's a Thursday. And uh, we'd like to see a lot of teenagers out for that. I'm going to talk with some other churches and try to get uh, them here as well because Pensacola is also going to be making a presentation um, about uh, the school. And uh, if you're interested in uh, Christian college or if that's on the table for uh, you and your kids, by the way, I think you ought to put it on the table and leave it there as long as God leaves it there. Um, it's a great opportunity. Pensacola uh, is one of the, the really good schools out there. They're accredited. Um, they are, um, and it's, it's a great campus. It's, it's very affordable. Very affordable as college goes. How many of you want to spend seventy thousand dollars over the course of four years? I know I don't. So, um, if without scholarships and things like that, state schools and things like that can be very expensive um, and costly. Maybe not seventy thousand expensive, but they're costly. Some of them are. Um, I, I wanted to go to Harvard, but I just couldn't make it, brother Jackie. I just couldn't didn't, couldn't afford it, but. Anyways, um, Pensacola is a great school, great opportunity. They're very affordable, so you ought to consider it. And they'll be here uh, to make a presentation about that. So get your teenagers here. Um, we'll have a meal, games, and they'll also provide a concert that night. Remember, junior and teen camp's coming up. I need to get those uh, registration forms back um, as soon as you can, parents. Um, and then also, I need to make an announcement. Let's do this real quick. Let's do our birthdays and anniversaries, and then I'll save that announcement for last. But uh, any birthdays to celebrate today? Any birthdays? All right, then anniversaries. All right, then. Well, happy birthday and anniversary to all the people who weren't here today, uh, but maybe would have been celebrating. So, all right. I got an announcement for you I need to share with you before we close up today. Um, so, I'll give you the, uh, the, the quick version of this. I wish I could give you the long form version of this, and maybe one day we will. Um, but many of you know the history of Midway um, that 16 years ago, in 2003, uh, some folks left from West Liberty Baptist Church and moved over across the street and founded Midway Baptist Church. And that church has continued, and here we are today in this beautiful location. We've, God's been blessing and doing some tremendous things uh, throughout the years, and we're thankful for each and every one of those things. And about um, a month and a half, maybe two months ago now, the interim pastor at West Liberty approached me and said, hey, can we sit down and talk sometime? I just want to get to know you a little bit, uh, hear your heart, and uh, just you know, basically make a friend. Um, so we sat down and we talked, and we began to discuss uh, some, of the, some of my beliefs and our church's beliefs and things like that, and, he, uh, and we began to discuss the history 
of uh, West Liberty and Midway, and we talked about the fact that there were some things that needed to be dealt with so that our churches could be in full fellowship with one another and our members be in full fellowship with one another. So we got to some folks together, we sat down, we talked through those things, and God brought some healing. Uh, In that situation, God's brought some wholeness and some restoration there, and we thank God for every bit of that. And so we were ready to step right back into fellowship, start um, enjoying each other's company and events and things like that. And then about a week or two later, uh, some men from West Liberty approached the interim pastor there and said, we would really like to get back together with some of the the leadership at Midway. And we've been thinking, and we we think that, you know, if we're going to have fellowship with one another... If we're so close to each other, they're here and we're right down the road, why don't we just go to church together? And so we all got together and we sat down and we started talking through uh, the possibility of merging West Liberty into Midway and the folks from West Liberty coming and being a part of Midway. And we had two meetings together and uh, there were uh, really no reason whatsoever to stop the discussions. We all decided that it was best to continue to explore that and uh, they went back to West Liberty and shared it with the people there, and the people uh, pretty much unanimously said, yes, we need to continue to explore this and think about this, and, and combining, and West Liberty coming and being a part of Midway. And so um, we've been talking more and more about that um, and having further discussions, and so um, I and one of our deacons last week went to church over there on Sunday night and just sat with them and got to talk with them some a little bit. We're going to go back again tonight um, and spend some time there. But this Wednesday, um, they are going to cancel their services over there and come have service here with us um, at Midway and be a part of our service. And that preacher, Brother Sager, is actually going to be preaching that night. Um, He's going to be preaching the 6th and, I'm sorry, the 5th, and the 12th. So they're going to be here for two, two Wednesday nights, the 5th and the 12th, and we're going to spend time with them, fellowship with one another. Um, and we're actually, um, this Wednesday, we'd like to put together sort of a um, cookie fellowship. What did you call that, Inez? Linger longer. We're going to do a little linger longer. So I've got to talk with Brother Sager about keeping it short on Wednesday, but uh, we're going to do a little linger longer and put out some cookies and small desserts and things like that and some coffee and so we can sit and talk together and uh, build that fellowship uh, with one another. So if you can be here Wednesday night, I want you to be here. Welcome them uh, with open arms and uh, let's, let's encourage uh, this step of faith that they've taken. This is not easy for them to do and we ought to be there to cheer them on for taking a step of faith and we'll just see what God does. We'll just see where, if God's in this or not. Um, and if you can contribute by bringing some desserts or something like that, if you would let Inez or Connie know that so we can be aware of what we've got coming, that'd be great. Um, and then they'll be back on the 12th. And the plan at this point, I just want to go ahead and share this with you now because it's just two weeks out. On the 16th, the plan is for them to be here on Sunday morning for Sunday school and the Sunday morning service, for them not to have service there at all, but to be here uh, for the entire morning on the 16th, the 23rd, and the 30th of June. So they will be here, and I'll be preaching those services on the 16th, 23rd, and 30th. And so they're going to come and be a part of everything that happens um, on Sunday morning here at Midway. And as I said, we're just going to see what God's going to do. We're just going to see if God knits hearts together and if God builds a fellowship there. And uh, I just want you at this point, first of all, to be aware of it so that you won't be surprised uh, by it. We want you to know what's going on. Um, But we also want you to be aware of it because we want you to be praying about it. We want you to be asking for God's wisdom on their hearts and on our hearts, for God to bring healing and help uh, to them right now. This is not an easy uh, thing for anybody to do. And so just ask for God's help uh, for them. And we will keep you up to date with what's going on um, with the conversations and discussions we're having. As we're going through this each week, we're going to talk. Um, and then I'm gonna, we're going to be talking with West Liberty. And then after it's over, we'll sit down and talk about the future and the possibilities for the future. So um, I just want you also to be aware that um, we're not asking them to come and change Midway. Okay, we're going to continue to be Midway Baptist Church. We're going to continue to be what um, we are and what we uh, want to be for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just want them to, uh, to be a part of that. 
uh, we, w- we would like to see that happen. So um, you just pray for them, pray for me and Brother Sager as we're conversing and working through things together. Um, and if you have any questions about that, I'd love to hear them. So come and see me, uh, call me, um, visit with me. I'd love to, to help you with that. You can also um, get with our deacons. They've been a part of a lot of those conversations. But if there's something they can't answer, I probably can. Uh, so uh, let's, let's uh, get the, the groundwork laid to welcome these folks uh, for uh, five services, okay? All right, well, um, if, uh, if God's people are pleased, let it be known by saying amen. Amen, amen. All right, well, let's stand together. We're going to be dismissed in a word of prayer, and uh, we will see you at the lunch table today as we dine together, and then also uh, for the 1 o'clock time, uh, we'll be back here in the auditorium for that. So uh, let's dismiss with a word of prayer. Brother Jimmy, leave us. Would you lead us in prayer, sir?